pain, anger, rivalry. Uh, these are primary factors behind our decisions and actions. In troubled times, uh, there are many more leaders because uh, there are many more emotions and feelings. Our feelings are the engine for everything. Neurophysiology will confirm that neuron transmitters uh, as the invisible side of our emotions affect the rate of brain activity, the strength of uh, impulse transmissions, and so on. What does it have to leadership? The most direct. Know yourself. Know your desires. Be in harmony with yourself. Maintain emotional well-being. And then you inner fire will be brighter than any outer flame. So driver one, get to know yourself. Don't betray your dreams. It is unforgivable in relation to yourself because uh, those around you may don't know about them. They would have done more for you than you for yourself. Driver two, every leader needs team. Uh, leadership, uh, for my opinion, is uh, the best way to interact. Leadership means to lead. The main thing is not forget to join hands. This is smart innovation leadership in turbulent times. Let's hold our hands tightly on the way to a common goal. Whatever external factors handle me, I will never let go of a friend's hand, for sure. I give you my hands on an interesting, challenging, long journey to innovation for world well-being. Are you with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia, for kicking the session off for the Education Visionaries. And uh, we have everyone in the audience. We have people connected on our channel. Let me just invite our next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Dimitri, you are here. I will put you uh, live. Now you can share your uh, camera and audio. And uh, Natalia, I will make you an attendee, but you can share your camera and audio and uh, you can introduce uh, Dimitri or uh, we are both here. Yeah. Yeah. Natalia, you will have to open your video and uh, voice again. And I need to share my screen. If you want okay. to, yeah. Perfect. So let me just uh, make a quick introduction on uh, Dimitri, who will be talking about the university needs uh, from private sector. So connecting from the corporate session, now moving into the academia, we want uh, to hear you know, what university would need from corporate sector to enable a better uh, you know, transition of the student from the academy to the industry. So, so I um, cannot share my screen, it seems. Uh, on the left, you have access to panel. Yeah, but I. Yes, I, I, I will... can't do it with Firefox. Yeah, try it again, please. I try to log in from another browser because no, Firefox doesn't to... allow me. Okay, you can do that. Firefox should allow you because Natalia's screen was uh, sharing, so you were probably not able to share because of that. If you try it now, okay.
so till i think the need three is in let us make him presenter and Dimitri, you can share your uh, audio and video, yes. Okay. So again, uh, an introduction. So we take the handover from corporate leaders with an academic perspective on uh, drivers that smart innovation leadership in disruptive times. Natalia and Dimitri set up the need that despite years of technological progress, universities are still facing issues of inefficiency, mistrust, and disconnect from the private sector. So the demand for that is going to be presented with um, in this next talk. So I will be muting myself off and turning my camera off. Dimitri, is all over to you. OK, thank you very much for this uh, great opportunity. and. It's not often that academics get chance to connect to other world, which is uh, somehow sad, but that's where we are. And I try to provoke some thoughts and tell us what the, tell you what the challenges are. So I'm a mathematics professor in Trinity College Dublin. And here, I uh, hope you can see my screen, a uh, couple of other affiliations. And uh, my slides, they're not going to be too many, but they're going to be dense. So please prepare for that. But I will share the slides and you get all the links, so don't worry. Very important, uh, everyone is welcome to the follow-up discussion. And uh, you see this is conforming to open science principle that I will present as something that help us from this crisis and uh, the other challenges. So let's move on. And so here are the challenges universities are facing. Underfunding, disconnect, mistrust, inefficiency, and incentives. So underfunding means we are lacking funding for supporting new initiatives. Everything is tight and is getting tighter. So uh, please be aware of this when you talk to us. Disconnect, uh, there is insufficient communication and collaboration, meaning also outside world, but also between each other. Uh, mistrust uh, is uh, resulting in excessive management and public skepticism. What we are doing, uh, what the science, uh, there is a lot of um, discussion, mistrust. Uh, sometimes uh, science is not properly uh, presented or data is not is missing. Inefficiency, too slow response to world changes and challenges. Yes, uh, many of colleagues are conservatives and the reason for that, and it's worth trying to understand it, but that's where we are. And finally, maybe the most important is lacking incentive, incentives and reward mechanism. And uh, this is really crucial whenever you deal with academics to think about incentives. And uh, the problem, extra time and effort spent may not translate into better recognition. So recognition is uh, one of the biggest incentives for academics, not necessarily money, but uh, recognition. Uh, what a value uh, can university bring to you, to private sector? So maybe that's the next point to start. If you are in the education or software business, uh, you can get a customer or the whole university can sign for your software and adopt it. Uh, credibility, if you get some advice, a partner on board, you get more trust from your customers, from funders, from other partners. Of course, expertise, obvious, uh, if you get some uh, subject experts advising on difficult parts, pointing to relevant research. So that's also important research, even if it's there, uh, things are hard to find. and. An expert can point you in the right direction. Now, maybe less obvious one, supervision. So we can even supervise some of your employees if you have some joint partnership. And uh, we can do it in a very time efficient base uh, that only when it's needed, we can point them and the rest uh, employees are doing. But that can save you a lot of efforts, a lot of time, pain to train uh, people. And of course, funding. If you need funding, there is... Uh, some uh, opportunities for joint grant applications. Now, next thing, challenges. So what do we actually need? Well, as I said, incentive is uh, something very big. So uh, help us with better recognition for our efforts. That's very big one. Because 
okay, what happens, what you're offering or asking will likely cost me time. And even if your product say my time later, it will cost my time now first. And finally, uh, it doesn't need to be complex. Just ask about incentive upfront. Simply talk to us. What gives us more recognition? And you will get some answer for sure. Uh, communication. Talk to us. Just give us more information and make responding easy. Talk to us, understand our challenges, make responding easy. Be upfront and transparent and show needs and benefits. Your needs from us and our benefits. Just two simple things and quick and transparent works great. Surveys, yeah, that's, that's very important and drives me absolutely mad. And if you are working on next survey, please, please, please uh, have a look at the surveys are boring and confusing and use open forums for real feedback where people can share ideas and see and get some interactions. Uh, and I'll come back to this. Minimize amount of information, focus on value, reduce time load, reduce email, okay? Use public information instead of email and open discussion. And save us time, show responses by colleagues. This is important. Uh, we keep uh, uh, in, it's very boring and you get the same boring answers from different people. If I see what my colleagues say, it saves me time. I don't need to repeat myself. And build user communities. So that's very helpful. Okay, that's almost uh, the last slide. So incentives. Incentives, you start here. This is the best place. Understand and create incentive. Talk to academics what matters. Talk to university administrators. Okay, not just to academics, about current and future incentives. Look up open science uh, for use of technology and help academics amplify the work. So this is a recognition part. And open science is where you can find information and uh, educate yourself, and that helps you. Understand benefits from open science policy and mandate. So there is a lot of discussion. It's a hot topic, and there are mandates, and uh, many scientists are annoyed or educators. Please help us make it more efficient and benefit, because this can benefit. To disconnect. Okay, this is also important. Fight isolation and inequality. Uh, so in academia, it can be frustrating, mentally challenging. And uh, that means uh, there is also room for help and opportunity. So help and connect and share concerns. Avoid, sorry, again, survey doesn't help us. It's boring and in no room for creative ideas and missed opportunities for us to connect because we could have had an open discussion and share real concern, support each other. So survey could be an opportunity rather than just boring survey. Mistrust, okay, why is there mistrust? You can win trust, whatever uh, the mistrust, by making the information easily findable, accessible. So mistrust is a lack of information. Something is hidden, I don't trust. Be as transparent as possible. And best open science practices help you to uh, how actually do it in practice. Information, data transparency, and accessibility. And inefficiency, this is really, killing a lot of enthusiasm and excitement because things are too hard, too long, uh, uh, people uh, just leave. So look for easy but impactful tasks. Long emails are not impactful. Replace with forum and user group. And finally, uh, this is the end. So join all our discussion, though this should not be the end. Uh, this is our forum, okay? It's a little picture, it's on GitLab. Everybody is welcome. So just click on this link, sign and continue. And this uh, slide will also be there. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dmitry. I think your speech will be very useful for academics and uh, for private sectors to make some algorithm to act to real act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Yeah, I'm a mathematician, so uh, I suppose that's the way we function. But yeah, I hope it gives some uh, perspective uh, from another yeah. world. So we have Ekaterina coming next. And uh, Dimitri, thank you again for uh, attending and uh, speaking about the things. I'm very sure that uh, the people who are listening and the corporates that have attended the session, they will 
you know take some notes and if you have any uh, connections that or if you need any kind of connections with the people who spoke today because they are the industry leaders and they have the network of um you know the clients or the people that they are interacting with uh, please reach us out with the you know any of the needs and if we can help you with some softwares like the offers that we you know got today from the corporates both mm-hmm. from dinergy and uh, you know people tree and the other showcases that are happening parallelly we can probably I, help you I, i i i'd love to connect to make it more efficient i i would invite everyone to simply present their product on our forum and yes. uh mm-hmm. we can have a great interaction you get some great audience a uh, lot of academics a lot of open science advocates and um you get a lot of feedback there yeah and please share, i yeah i would appreciate to share my uh, slides so people find all the information yes but uh, i also shared linkedin yes so thank you and i will make you an attendee now and i will pass the control to ekatrina Okay thank you very much So Ekatrina you have the presentation rights uh, now Yes First of Let all me, hello Yeah give me a I, moment to introduce you and then we can uh go ahead or if natalia wants to do that uh, she probably knows you much better but let me let me see or oh, uh, i can do myself because i also prepared a couple of words about myself and what i'm doing perfect so your uh, speaking topic is role of a teacher in adopting technology in education there is a very good reason why we put you you know right in the beginning so that you know the transition goes from um, you know explaining what is the need then uh, you know what is happening and then we go on to some detailed solutions which will be presenting their own uh, particular uh, topics so i will uh, just go out of the room and the video is all yours fantastic once again thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very interesting event uh, to this fantastic panel with a lot of distinguished speakers My name is Ekaterina Tsaranok. I'm the founder of the Modern Education and Research Institute. I will refer to it as MERI. So, we are based in Brussels in the heart of the European Union and we are one of the premier establishments dedicated to modernizing and uh, innovating in the ever-changing uh, field of education. Our focus is primarily aimed at contributing to the modernization uh, of the teaching profession and the adaptation of most the university teaching staff and administration to those changes uh, this is mainly achieved by conducting research organizing um, educational programs uh, along with scientific conferences our members consist of universities and individual professors from the countries of um central asia and uh, eastern partnership countries as well as russia um besides working on behalf of our members uh mary officially represents two universities from central asia in the european union and despite the geographic uh, distance those universities are full fledged actors in the global academic process so the universities are um Lev Nikolaevich Gumilev Eurasian National University and Central Kazakhstan Academy so both of them are from Kazakhstan we represent our universities in meetings organized by numerous european institutions in brussels by university associations and other academic partners where we uh, monitor developments uh, in the field of higher education in the education policy of the european union funding programs uh, we search for prospective partners uh, for our universities and uh, so the seeds of cooperation agreements our research shows that integration of technology into teaching and learning is uh, one of the main trends taking place in education around the whole world there are of course many reasons why technology is finding itself and will continue to find itself more intensely and readily in our classrooms 
Firstly, the global social impact of a rapid, uh, rapid technological uh, change requires integration of technology in the higher education curricula. And it is needed at least to close the digital divide, the digital gap, and to, to link uh, learning outcomes with the demands of employers from industries whose production and management processes were automated already long ago. Secondly, uh, technology will help alleviate an ever-increasing financial burden since uh, obtaining a higher education has become a massive and universal endeavor. And there are still a lot of countries, uh, especially in the European Union, where education is free of charge and demand for it is growing. The third reason that I would like to mention um, is um, the following. Technology contributes to the growing internationalization of higher education. Uh, for example, um, communication with foreign partners became easier uh, with the creation of Google Translate. Now, it is not necessary for a manager of the international department to have a native level of a foreign language, although for sure it remains a great advantage. Fourthly, fourthly um, technology-supported learning attracts so-called non-traditional students, such as working people, um, people living in remote areas, and also students that uh, cannot pursue traditional education due to medical reasons. Let us recall such an example. Uh, in 2017, 8 million retired people um, were enrolled in 70,000 colleges and universities in China. Uh, at the beginning of August uh, of this year, so 2020, we learned that Giuseppe Paterno, a 96-year-old grandfather, received his first university degree with top honors in Italy. No one has ever counted on this category of students anymore, and it is possible mostly because of technology. The fifth reason that I would like to mention here uh, is mm, communication. Technology helps educators communicate with students in both real time, for example, through Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Telegram for information transfer, and also non-synchronously by email, for example, through educational platforms such as Moodle. Then, um, quality instruction content uh, is becoming more and more accessible through technology. We have free access uh, to scientific articles, e-books, curricula of many top universities around the world due to technology. And lastly, technology is aiming at improving the quality of learning in general and learning outcomes of each student in particular. Technology makes it possible to cater the individual um, learning needs and demands of every student. Every student. We also notice that uh, higher education. One second. So, somehow I cannot get to, to my next slide. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> so we also notice that higher education institutions are um, integrating technology into administrative processes as well into teaching uh, at a much, much slower pace than other industries and yet with higher expectations. There are a number of reasons uh, why this happens. Uh, so integration of digital technologies uh, in education is quite a recent phenomenon. And of course, creating uh, theory and concepts around this process takes time. In addition, we need to say that different technologies provide obviously different opportunities. If we take, for example, computer-based student assignment, uh, electronic textbooks, uh, computer simulators, 
gamification, flipped classrooms, mass open online courses, collaborative distant learning environments, uh, learning management systems. Of course, these are all um, technologies that are targeting completely different needs of educators. Educators use those technologies also to varying degree, partly because uh, of the nature of their co um, courses, so of the content also of their courses, but also partly because um, of their views on education in general and their views on their own role in the educational process. Educational technologies are also constantly changing to better meet continuous emerging needs. And uh, also, I would like to add here that most studies conducted over the past two decades are case studies that examine how and to what extent a particular technology of lear or learning environment um, has been used to support a specific course. So in other words, we understand that such studies may be ambiguous and also mm, inconclusive. In order to better understand this issue, it is necessary to identify the most significant indicators of success of technology implementation and the main factors uh, and conditions uh, for its integration. And despite governments and institutions adopt uh, unified educational policies and mechanisms, uh, integration of technology still depends on many factors. And these factors may vary from country to country, from region to region, from uh, institution to institution, just because of the different tools and methodologies that those institutions, regions or countries use. Nevertheless, a number of success uh, indicators can be still identified and they go beyond the specific conditions of application of this or that technology. One of the leading think tanks, uh, the Online Learning Consortium, uh, formerly known or maybe to some of you um, known as Sloan Consortium, has identified, identified the so-called five pillars of quality in online learning or five building blocks for successful online learning. And although I refer here to online learning, we also understand that technology does not necessarily have to relate only to online engagement. Technology can also be applied offline as well. So those indicators that were identified are learning efficiency, access, scale, teacher satisfaction, and of course, student satisfaction. Systemic and comprehensive studies uh, published over the past two decades indicate that uh, educators' point of view, attitudes, motivation, skills, competences, uh, as well as professional development are the most important factors affecting the successful uh, integration of technology in education. There are even more important, um, there are no more important factors than uh, educators' satisfaction and educators' point of view, even such factors as student skills, logistics, um, course content, university policy are less important to the human factor, which is um, the development of educators, of teachers. And thus, we can speak about the role of uh, teachers uh, in the process of adopting technology in education. And here I would like to present five factors, main factors from my point of view, but of course there are even more roles that teachers can play in adopting technology. So the first role uh, as a Russian physicist and demographer Sergei uh, Petrovich Kapitsa used to say is, we teach to understand, not to remember. Artificial intelligence is in charge of remembering for us today. And by the way, uh, it is even much better than people in this regard. A teacher should have the skills to develop students' critical, logical, and alternative thinking, first of all. The next role of a teacher is 
to help uh, students cultivate adaptability for constant change. Knowledge is a social artifact and should be seen as transient, changing, and not absolutely objective. The modern teacher is not required uh, to be the Delphic Oracle and know everything. I I think we lost uh, Ekaterina. I will make her a presenter again. Ekaterina, if you can hear me, you yes, I'm back again. Sorry, I think yeah. there was a technical, a technical problem at a certain point. Okay, I go on then. Yeah. So. I was uh, I was talking about the second uh, the second role of a teacher, which is help students cultivate uh, adaptability for constant change. And I wanted to describe one um, one meeting that I had in the business school ES in Barcelona when I coordinated a group of professors who came to this business school to uh, to have a program of uh, professional development. So we encountered Professor Connor Neal, who is a star professor, absolutely star. But besides teaching, Professor Neal also has a couple of private businesses. So uh, uh, from time to time, Professor uh, brings his business problems as business cases to his audience, uh, to the classroom, and asks students to discuss those problems in groups and come up with solutions. And uh, Professor Neil told us that he was surprised how many unusual, how many brilliant ideas uh, his students uh, brought uh, for his business, so solving his business cases and business problems. And once uh, a student came up to him after the class and ask the question, so what the correct answer to the business case was? And Professor Neil has, had absolutely no, uh, no problem to say, I don't know, I wanted to ask you. So in addition to purely practical benefits for himself, uh, Professor Neil has thus helped his students to improve their thinking at a higher level, including metacognitive and self-regulatory skills. Skills in critical thinking, in analytical thinking, self-awareness, uh, self-confidence, communication skills. These are the skills that are extremely vital to flourish in our rapidly changing world. Students were able to use gadgets, messengers, any kind of computer modeling software to perform the task that Professor Neil gave them. And most notably, the attempt to evaluate the successful integration of technology in this particular case uh, on the result of traditional tests and examination um, does not correspond to the logic and possibilities of technology. The third role of a teacher that I would like to uh, bring up here is to develop skills to verify information. We are exposed to a large number of information. So just imagine that one week of reading the New York Times exposes us to more information than people were exposed to in the 18th century during their entire life. Forbes magazine has reported that uh, the total number of pages indexed in Google is over one trillion. Thus, it is not surprising that students find it difficult to cope with this flow of very controversial information. Technology may play an essential role in helping students to separate, as we say, the wheat from the chaff. The next role of the teacher is developing uh, the student's ability to live in the digital world and preserve humanity. At the end of the 80s, uh, there was a time when people in technical professions were not in need. 
I'm talking here mostly about uh, Eastern Europe because this is where I grew up and this is what I saw with my own eyes. I have experienced all this. But then times changed and the humanities professions somehow fell into the backdrop. However, now we're witnessing the rebirth of philosophy, sociology, psychology, linguistics, uh, art, and other humanities subjects again. So we are moving towards a society of trans people. Uh, how will we coexist in the same reality with synthetic and genetically modified organisms? So what social, cultural, ethical, legal norms will govern our relationships? Uh, the Chinese uh, created a robot named Sophia, probably all of you have already heard about this experiment, who was the first robot to obtain citizenship and may eventually legally marry. The preservation of humankind and humanity is in our hands of teachers, educators, professors. And the last role I would like to mention here in my presentation is to teach students to learn and to resist stress. Uh, the point uh, here is uh, closely linked to the students growing responsibility for the results of their studies, which uh, led to the possibility of creating such a mega successful project as Ecole 42. Although education in this concept is more peer and technology based, uh, it is still a very good illustration of how the role of the teacher is changing. And it still remains central. Without proper pedagogically designed um, projects, learning would be sporadic and inefficient. And here we come to the topic of emerging professions for people uh, with a pedagogical background, such as tutor, a moderator, a coordinator of, of educational online platforms, a developer of educational trajectories, a developer of educational games, and so on and so forth. This is, however, the topic for another presentation, and I really look forward to the next opportunity to share the results of my research with you, dear colleagues and dear participants. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ekaterina, so much. I absolutely agree with you, and I think that uh, students' uh, emotional well-being is very important. And uh, today we have many uh, theories uh, about um, uh, to use uh, phenomenon yoga in educational process. Um, that's why your opinion is very um, innovative and very um, scientific. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next, we introduce Renata. Hi, Renata. So uh, thank you, Ekaterina. We will make you an attending and we will introduce Renata to the room. Renata, do you hear us? Yes. Uh, I have uh, invited Renata to the room. Now Renata can... Hi. I, <laughs> so nice to see you. Oh, okay, I got a different control now. It's okay. Yes, I was you worried are. that I couldn't uh, share or do something with this Mac and technology, but it should be okay, right? Yes. Thank you. Now oh. you have all the power. Yeah. Screen Natalia. sharing or present? Yeah, Natalia. The yeah, presentation is uploaded. Yes, Where do I, I find it? Renata. Renata is assistant Please. professor and postdoc generalist with many specialities, bring us to a specific collaboration tool that inspires distance learning participants and adaptation from stressful transition to distance learning, to distance pedagogic and online tools. Thank you very much. We are waiting. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I, I, I was happy when you invited me. Thank you very much, Natalia. And this is just one and uh, one of many enjoyable, let's say, collaborations that we started. I cannot even imagine how nice. I even have you cited somewhere there in the presentation. You will see. Um, OK, uh, congratulations for the event. It's so professionally organized and so uh, everything is like fluent. There is even no even though you men mentioned surprises, there's, I don't know, on your side, but on this side, it looks perfect. Congratulations on that. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, and to, yeah, the, the, the domain where I could uh, share my thoughts is uh, appropriate. So uh, I'm happy to, that I was given a chance to think and contemplate something and present it, articulate it, let's say, because uh, one of the classes that I'm uh, teaching to, to students is change management, actually. And we always say change. What do, what do we mean? It's adapting to change. Okay. But what if you want to initiate, enforce change? towards positive uh, something. And then it's the, the, it's twofold. We had to adapt because it was disruptive, uh, pandemic and uh, the, the pandemic was disruptive and disturbant. Disruptive in innovation means something positive, but here it was a punctuation of an equilibrium. And then we had to situate ourselves and eventually in time, things mature and we can initiate and uh, take uh, take it in a positive direction. Even in complexity theory, in complex adaptive systems, the new uh, reconfigured uh, setup is different. Hopefully it will be different towards better. That's why I set my title here, initiating positive after adapting to the negative change. Uh, I would like to ask you all not to do it, but to think what it would mean if you had to change the room and continue having this conference and summit. If you had to go to the other room, well, think think a little bit. I'm taking the computer. I need my charger. The internet is not so good. The cable needs to be adjusted. Uh, I have to restart. Oh my God, this happened. Oh, the chair is not so good. The, the babies are somewhere, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just one small movement from here to there. And uh, let alone all these big, complex turbulences that were uh, happening, especially uh, recently. So that's that that that's something that I would like to uh, invoke. It's in uncomfortable. It's a shock. Not many people would like to experience it. But uh, then, uh, eventually, time comes when we uh, get the ideas, have the uh, the fruitful uh, system, and start going upwards. And that's what we should try to do as humanity. I will try to go to the next slide. It's going. Briefly about me, uh, Natalia introduced me and the presentation is available. There are all links. And finally in my life, I managed to make a one pager of my <laughs> CV or something profile. So here is the LinkedIn, here is uh, everything, my affiliations, my work, my voluntary things, everything, all in one. So whoever is interested, feel free to uh, look, look into it. Many of my colleagues also mentioned, so you will hear many concepts similar to the to what has been spoken. I will try to take a, a little bit um, different perspective, but in principle, we are all going there. It's uh, not something like uh, an intelligence that needs to be uh, now developed and uh, activated uh, in our students, in our learners, in ourselves, and in this ecosystem that you are all designing and working towards. Uh, because it's not just factual. Now it's also applicable, now it's also reasoning, now it's also iterative. Uh, you don't know the future, you cannot just plan it, you have to adapt, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So many of the words are the same, I know. But uh, what, uh, what kind of intelligence, uh, meaning understanding and intuitively uh, using and uh, utilizing what is given in technology terms, economical, social, political, cultural, and that, that's all necessary with the learners so far. And we have to say, because it's not given, also Ekaterina said previously, it, nothing is given uh, uh, anymore. It can be, it has to, we have to know how to learn, find it, learn it, apply it, but then unlearn it and relearn it with different perspective or with different configuration. And that's why these, uh, these references are valid for the next, let's say, for the future. Uh, another perspective that I would like to point out is that has to be taken is the big picture. So it's a complex issue. Uh, higher education or any uh, medicine or uh, healthcare, or any system is complex. Here we are taking the educational system. And these are the latest references from uh, coming from European Commission and uh, UNICEF. So um, even if we, if we put the, the development of the learners in the, in the center, we, we will be able to see that it's so many entities and stakeholders and relations that are in the game for, in order for things to be functional. Imagine if they are unmotivated and unwilling to do so, if they are reluctant or scared. So uh, under the assumption that everybody wants to, it's still questionable whether we will achieve positive impact and improve our lives, let alone if many are discouraged, 
stressed, uh, unmotivated, disengaged, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, here we are mentioning authorities, uh, ministries, um, faculties, universities, uh, aside from the main learners and teachers and professors and researchers and science, NGOs, uh, local community, parents, guardians, the entire educational system and all the changes that are happening. And uh, one good structure that was uh, in these latest publications was uh, the, the direct, let's say, stakeholders and concerns are coming uh, around the school leadership, legislation, managing uh, the distance and the blended learning that I will speak again uh, later, uh, the role of the teachers and their competencies and conditions, uh, learners, the assessment of the learners is a big issue, well-being, coping, tolerance, acceptance, collaboration, school community and quality assurance. So many things just just dropped here and uh, that, that, that can branch out into and go in depth uh, pretty much. What were the biggest challenges so far? Lack of preparation time. Uh, yeah, we don't have the time. We don't know. Nobody taught us. But actually, it was the ones who were giving the uh, doing uh, practicing the blended learning aspects. So the hybrid between online and offline, in person and uh, virtual. Those are the ones that did develop, uh, and we can uh, turn to them for some good practices. So it's not that uh, we have to d design everything from scratch. It's just that they weren't so vocal or present, uh, or as now when we are redesigning uh, the, the educational systems and the future, uh, future prospects, let's say. Uh, the teacher-learner isolation, so one of the business communication and the communication issues is to close your communication, whether it's by nodding or pupils or students sleeping in their chairs or whatever it's happening, you have to know it. And now you don't, there is a, a screen or a photo or nothing, just the initials. So this isolation needs to be specifically tackled and the, the need to, for effective pedagogical approaches, instructional design, whatever we call it. It's different, it's not the same. So that's why we have to go in depth in novel uh, solutions in these directions. I will show uh, two of, of the things that are coming from my, let's say, my science that I'm trying to pr promote and incorporate. And uh, it look, all of them look like this, like uh, Natalia knows it, uh, systems, uh, diagrams of roles and accountabilities with the primary purpose here and roles, and they are populated by uh, different people or subsets or subsystems of people. And uh, actually, uh, this is something that was happening. Uh, we worked with my colleague, uh, Professor Salamovska, in, uh, this, uh, in, in this direction for blended learning. And actually before the pandemic, two years before the pandemic. And it was a combination of Moodle, so we can call it a distance learning platform, where we asynchronously, but also synchronously, uh, combine and put the materials, assignments, communicate bidirectionally, but from any time, any device, any place, and in own pace and time. Uh, office hours consultation, email, okay, again, asynchronous, mobile apps, chat, instant messaging. Now we're going to more synchronous, proximing each other, Skype for the uh, direct uh, video exchange, let's say, uh, uh, streaming and direct communication, Google Docs, Forms, Sheets and Drive for uh, collaboration, uh, and Facebook directly, indirectly, with a portal, with the feedback. So uh, as, it, as we can see before the pandemic, it, blended learning was pretty much there. Uh, now these percentages may differ because it, the accent is more on e-learning platforms. It can be pay, with paywall or even better if free uh, or accessible to the public with other business models. So it's similar, but maybe the percentages or the diapason of offerings is now different. Here there are many more uh, online streaming, uh, uh, Zoom and uh, etc. So different uh, offerings that exist from technology now and in a year for sure many more and um, actually here is what we would like to see uh, in the higher education system this is the primary pur purpose and it is to achieve applicable theoretical and practical quality academic knowledge skills and competences so it's an outcome it's not an output it's not just giving lectures it's achieving this practical academic knowledge and uh, with proper quality uh, and uh, with proper theory and it brings 
uh, something from the students. So they have a role in this co-creation. Co co it's high school knowledge, the foundation, the knowledge, the, the ability to learn. It's a lot of uh, practical experience and modalities, how to apply it. It's a lot of quality in the lectures. And now the instructional design is different and needs to be updated. Technology support, regulational uh, institutional support, ongoing research that is feeding the lectures and trying to keep the, the state of the art and the accurate, uh, accurate knowledge. Logistics, monitoring, evaluation, profiling, etc. And I would ask the question, uh, so I'm uh, nearing the end. And uh, yeah, we constantly have to iterate. We don't know the future. So we have to go step by step, like landing mission to Mars or something. Uh, sensing, interpreting, deciding and acting and small plans or bigger plans that are constantly revised through these loops that this is just a visual. Um, and actually, if we ask ourselves, what is the situation before, now and for the future? The outcome should be the same. So it, we have to uh, achieve applicable theoretical and practical quality academic knowledge, skills and competences. It's just that we need to emphasize how it needs to be co-created between the the providers and facilitators of knowledge these are universities professors but also lifelong learning platforms uh, vocational training schools and uh, and all the variety that is now out there uh, and the student is, is such an important also uh, partner in this it's not giving and receiving it's co-creating together and actually in all of these uh, they need to remain maybe the connections need to be stronger uh, maybe the depth should be bigger uh, but in principle the primary purpose stays the system with some roles to be added and removed also stays the motivation needs to be there and uh, here i have a note of changes to be initiated co-creation as i said multidisciplinarity interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity purpose driven not just for per se Outcomes, not just outputs. Accountability for my role. If I'm a student, if I'm a parent, what is my role? If I'm a teacher, and etc. Ecosystem engagement, iterative probing, and the loops. And actually, my main point here is that digitalization, the tools, the platforms, the ICT should follow and facilitate, should inspire and enable these co-evolutionary co purposes. Not vice versa. We cannot follow the robot. We need to or, or artificial intelligence or uh, everything that is uh, latest uh, in the world. We actually, they have actually need to serve the purpose of humanity, co-evolving also with nature, also with this uh, ecosystem of uh, environmental uh, aspect, etc. And that's why this concluding slide is uh, inspired by the co-dreaming uh, introduction of the world by Natalia, which is here at the top and the reference goes to her co-innovating, co-leading, co-learning, co-teaching, co-iterating, coping, consoling, comforting, co-experiencing, co-competing, so collaborating and competing, co-creating in order to co-evolve together. And that takes professionalism, but also voluntarism, selflessness, openness, purpose, adaptability, and for sure, good intentions, like the ones that you are having and that you are engaging all of us. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. If there are questions or later on, feel free to contact me. Wow, Renata, I've taken a screenshot of your last slide and ah, this, was, this was yeah. something really nice. <laughs> okay, Natalia. Um, well, we have a game that we want to play with uh, you. If you have uh, some okay. extra minutes, I will okay. present Sophia to do that. And uh, Renata, I will make you an attendee because Sophia will be yeah. sharing her screen and she will explain you what the game is. Okay. okay. So you, as soon as you receive, uh, like I make you an attendee, you will lose your mic okay. and video. So just activate it again. And all the people who are watching you on YouTube can also play along. So, you know, take uh, the chance to comment live and, uh, you know, let's see how this goes. Okay. So Renata, you will have to activate your mic and video again. Okay. And uh, Sophia, where are you? I need to give you access. Yeah. I hope my internet lasts. Well, I see you. I, uh, I don't see you, Sophia, in the list. Mm -hmm. 
Well, but I'm there. She's in attendees. Yes, she's here. Did you get the control? Yes. Okay, I am off. <laughs> so you're seeing my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to play a game. Our... Sorry? Renata has not uh, given access to her video. Yeah. I'm trying, but my, my internet is going down. So let's. Okay, play. okay. I'll... I can hear you. It's okay. We can start if you want. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so do you like movies? Yeah, binge watching. <laughs> okay, so this game, I'll show you characters and real people and companies and everything. Oh my Can God, you... do I get my daughter with me? <laughs> <laughs> and you have to guess uh, who is the oldest, okay? Who is the, who is the what? Oldest. oldest. Oldest, oh my God. Not okay. younger, okay. oldest. Yeah. So okay. we'll start with, I think, an easy one. Frank Sinatra uh, and Batman. Okay. Uh, Who do you think? Frank Sinatra and Batman. Frank Sinatra and Batman. Pff, I have no idea. I'll show the answers Ooh. in the Frank end. Frank Sinatra. Okay. Sinatra, let's see. Okay. Say. Cinderella and Trump. Cinderella, the <laughs> Cinderella. Disney movie. Yeah. Okay. Cinderella, the Disney movie. Oh, okay. Oh, with Trump. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with Cinderella. Okay. Cinderella. And Sh Shrek and Harry Potter, both first movies. The first movies. Shrek. First movie of, of Shrek and first movie of, of Harry Potter. Harry Potter was 2000 and Shrek was, I would say Harry Potter. Okay. Marilyn Monroe or Winnie the Pooh? Winnie the Pooh or Marilyn Monroe? Who is aye, the oldest? Aye, 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 aye. Winnie the Pooh. Okay. The Beatles or Barbie? Or Barbie. So there were no Barbies when I grew up, so probably the Beatles. Okay. Toy Story or Amazon? Toy Story or Amazon? Amazon. Amazon, I would say. Okay. Spice Girls or Pokemon? Pokemon. Spice Girls, for sure. If you want to be my lover. Spider-Man or Pink Panther? Uh, Marvel Comics. Okay, Spider-Man probably. Spider-Man. Minecraft, Minecraft or the movie Avatar? Minecraft or Avatar? Minecraft or uh, Minecraft? It's it's these other games that are played. I know. I I think Minecraft. Okay, so are you ready to know the answers? Oh. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, the yellow what ones is, were the oldest. And uh, Frank what Sinatra. is my score? Okay, Frank Sinatra. I, I said that, right? I, I think so, yeah. Oh, uh, you said Cinderella. It was Donald Trump. Yeah. I changed my mind to the during, but okay. okay uh, you said Harry Potter. It's Shrek. In 2001. <laughs> Oh, come on, it's yeah. months. You shouldn't have done with months. I was pretty yeah. close. <laughs> okay. Uh, you said Marilyn Monroe, I, I believe. I don't yeah, remember what. Yeah, me too. I think. It's <laughs> need one book. year. Oh, come on. You have, yeah. me, you have to give me credit for a year or months. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the yeah. Beatles and Barbie. Um, I was correct. Fun fact, um, Star, the drummer, he only got in in six, uh, 62, so which would make them younger than Barbie. Oh, but, but it says here 58, huh? Yeah, the, um, the Lennon, McCartney and Harrison, Trier. they got together. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Toy Story and Amazon. Amazon was first, you, you got yeah. it right. Yeah, yeah. Spice Girls were first, right? Yeah. Spider-Man was first too for one year. I was right there, okay. And yeah. Minecraft. Minecraft again, a matter of months. In months. months. Okay, okay. And? 
and that's it. Yay! It was such a fun. <laughs> I had to. Ta- I should have taken my daughter. She was advised me for something. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Thank you. It was a pleasurable experience. Yay! <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Renata, very much. Yeah, Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you, Natalia, for inviting me. Congratulations on the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Ciao. Thank you. And next, our speaker is uh, Andrea. So, yeah, I will make Andrea the presenter. Uh, and I will make Sophia back. Okay. So Andrea, okay. if yeah you are there, you can just a moment. Uh, you can unmute yourself and you can uh, give access to your camera so we can see you. Hello, hello, do you hear me? Okay, can you can you hear me? Okay. I hope my internet connection will maintain the connection since I'm uh, not actually I'm on Sardini. Very well here. Uh, then I will try to share my screen. I have to do that. Can I present Andrea? Andrea is uh, education yeah, sure. director, digital transformation expert. In uh, this session. Andrea will share uh, his experience uh, in introducing distance learning tools and techniques in the contents of uh, professional schools. You're welcome. Uh, okay, here it is. I'm uploading the presentation. I hope it's coming. Uh, there too much time. Uh, yes, in today's presentation, I would like to share with you some experience I had uh, in managing distance learning and, and particularly, of course, uh, the online learning during the COVID crisis uh, that I mean, was present in basically most of the presentation I heard uh, because, of course, it's something that really changed our way of doing, um, of doing uh, learning and, and doing uh, education. In particular, my experience was on a vocational and professional school. Uh, and so to my uh, I share file. How can I, uh, sorry, how can I share my screen? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. I just it took me some time to share my, my screen. You should now see me. Um, as I was saying, uh, I'd like to share uh, my, my experience about distance learning in complex contexts. Why do I say complex contexts? Because I had to do, uh, for one of my experiences, distance learning for a vocational and professional school, which I think introduces some sort of difficulty because the kind of students that we have there uh, are not the usual um, graduating students from university. I mean, they are less mature to some extent. And so on, uh, on computers uh, is sometimes more difficult for, for them. Uh, 
Uh, a few words about me. When I, when COVID uh, came uh, in Italy, where, where I live, uh, I was actually doing three things uh, together. I was uh, uh, participating to the organization of courses for different ed education subjects, uh, schools and universities, like the vocational and professional school I will talk about. Then I was teaching AI and computer science into two uh, university courses, and I was also studying for a master. So actually, I was a student. I was, I was, let's say, engaged with education at all levels, as an administrator, as a teacher, and as a student. And so I had the opportunity to see what distance learning and online learning means on all these uh, fields of, of application. Uh, to uh, given this this experience, I will share some thoughts in my presentation. So the, the cause, the situation that started anything, as you for sure know, is the uh, situation about the COVID uh, um, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic that we had uh, this, this year uh, that br brought some sanitary disposition that limits strongly uh, the possibility ability of meeting in person with people and so of course created some disruption into into education to my uh, to my understanding for me the path that we all followed during this crisis is uh, uh, typical of uh, the so-called uh, hero's journey we all started uh, as the hero in most of the stories that we know uh, in the ordinary world uh, the so-called known world the upper side of this uh, of this cycle we were doing uh, lessons and education and we were teaching in traditional ways in class was ordinary and somehow uh, steady. We were not doing uh, something completely different from what we have done uh, before. Then something happened. I mean, we did not have the, the possibility to refuse the call or somehow to be helped by a mentor, but we had uh, an event, uh, the outspread of the coronavirus uh, and, and the, the sanitary dispositions uh, that made us cross the threshold and made us come into the, an unknown world, an unknown world where all education should, should be moved online, should be moved on uh, IT platforms and should happen synchronously or asynchronously on, uh, let's say, different means of communication. In this uh, path, in the unknown world, uh, we had a lot of enemies, we had a lot of difficulties, we had to overtake a lot of problems, uh, um, and I mean... and tackle of these problems and solve of these problems to try and continue the education go on to try and continue to teach our students and to make them learn even in, in this difficult situation so this was our ordeal this was our uh, bad situation that all heroes have in their journey uh, if we managed to solve this problem uh, we got uh, some rewards we got some good results uh, but then we also started a road back a road back back to the known world uh, that after this path will no more be like the world that we left at the very beginning so we know that we are not over yet with, with covid uh, unfortunately and we have second waves happening or likely to happen in the near future but yet if we look uh, in the future probably covid will be will be uh, back in the past it's a new world we will have a new situation and we as heroes need somehow to guarantee that the new situation the new equilibrium will be better than the the, for the first equilibrium where we started so from this path in the unknown world, what I would like to share with you is that I think we can take some peace back to the to the ordinary world to make it a better place, to make it more effective, more engaging, uh, and more I don't know positive than the the, the the old one. So my presentation will be very brief, but divided into these three sections. We will start from the known world and we'll present our situation before the COVID outspread. Then I will guide you through the unknown world and most of the things that have already been told by other speakers, but I would like to guide you through some specific actions that we, we placed and some of the results that we observed. And then I would leave you with the...
crisis uh, um, in, in the world, in the ordinary world, um, after the crisis. So to make it better than it was uh, at the very beginning. So where did we start? So we started from this situation. What you see here is that, uh, as, I, as, I, as I described, I will present the experience of a vocational school that, that has roughly uh, 4,000 students, so not uh, a couple, of course, but, uh, but I mean, qu quite a number. And as you can see from the map, uh, they are quite widespread on the territory of Lombardy. Lombardy was, if you don't know, but I think you know because you have read on the newspaper, was probably the first region uh, which was struck to up to date is the region that has uh, more uh, cases of contagion and which is where the, the situation is more and size of the is the number of students that we have different locations. So the, the goal was to somehow uh, react to the COVID crisis, making all these courses continue uh, in all the, the, the situation, all the places, um, without having the possibility of keeping uh, contact uh, uh, with students, a physical contact with students, and also, uh, I mean, uh, engaging with uh, one of the most critical situations situation uh, of, about the COVID infection in, in, in Europe. The other difficulty that we that we had uh, that I anticipated is that um, the my organization was uh, organizing was dealing with with vocational and professional courses. This means that students, some of the students, do study electronics and technology, but others study. To, to, to work with good uh, uh, on the picture. And we also um, had a school, have a school of restoration. Uh, so restore, making a restoration of work in, in, in the house of every student, uh, it's sometimes more difficult uh, to, to achieve than by, for example, studying mathematics or studying computer science uh, uh, on distance. The students that we have to, to deal with are students uh, uh, of professional courses, and this implies that most of them have low familiarity with technology. They are more, uh, let's say, handy people, and they do not use very much computers, telephones, and things like that. Some of the students are more students respectful or respectful uh, uh, subjects to talk to. And so, I mean, when the crisis hit, we had the fear most of them could get lost interest in participating into the courses and eventually drop the course and not participating anymore. And then, of course, as I already somehow anticipated, we had to deal with very a very practical learning subjects. Uh, so um, crafting the woods, uh, cooking uh, uh, some, I don't know, some, some dishes. Uh, and, and, you know, in Italy, we take cooking very seriously uh, or doing some restoration of uh, hard works. Uh, and this is something which is not easily, um, I mean, doable uh, over the internet uh, on, on Skype, on Zoom, uh, or whatever technology you would like you would like to use. So in this situation, we had COVID, and so we had the, the school going and what we did, of course, is that we did what basically anybody did, um, like us in the situation. We tried to rapidly and the quickest possible um, moving to uh, teaching activities online. So basically, we tried to leverage a new learning platform that we already had for some of the didactics and some of the educational uh, activities. And we somehow enriched our platform with, with a video conference system that permitted uh, uh, synchronous lessons uh, with students. So we tried to organize classes which were not the copies of the classes in the classroom, but were readaptation of the materials and the subjects of study to be, uh, let's say, irrigated and be and promoted.
of implementing a system to evaluate the results of the education that we that we did. So basically, we need to find a way to make exam online. Uh, we are in Italy, so basically we are not very much used to, to doing many tests at the end of the learning paths. Uh, so when we have exams, uh, usually they are not in the form of, of, of tests. While uh, uh, online platforms do implement very well test uh, test uh, uh, exam exams uh, to be submitted to students so we need to find ways to make the exams uh, online uh, using the tools that we had the forms uh, and let's say test like uh, situations where we tried to, to uh, be more discursive and having exams more similar to the one that we had to tackle was how to um, be sure that students were not coping or were not suggested by someone else during the examinations. So uh, we wanted to be sure that during the exams, the students could prove their abilities, their own abilities and not abilities of someone else. Uh, and so all of this situation created difficulties and created complex situations uh, for, for the education to, to continue. And uh, uh, I mean, the, to, to me, the, let's say the main uh, actors uh, that managed to overtake the situations uh, in a positive way were actually the teachers. The teachers were the key elements, the real heroes, as I said before in my first slide, uh, that helped uh, uh, tackle, tackling all the problems uh, of this online learning uh, uh, situation and made uh, the situation positive the beginning it's not what we planned to be doing uh, since the very the very beginning yet teacher when started to implement uh, these new ways of teaching uh, at the very beginning they were, they were very positive so they were very engaged and they really wanted to start doing things online even if they probably uh, never did something similar before that uh, but they tried to use the new technologies and online technologies to make the learning continue. Uh, they also, of course, had some difficulties. One of the main difficulties that they had uh, was already mentioned by other speakers was, let's say, the feeling of being speaking to themselves. So when you do a, uh, an online lesson like I'm doing right now, I am speaking, but I do not see all of you in face. I do not have a, let's say, a sense of the classroom. Uh, or, or the class and so on. So basically, this uh, this feeling was probably one of one of the most difficult barriers to to overtake. Of course, then practical activities were very much sacrificed, uh, and also, as we already in part discussed, uh, the homework and test uh, uh, part was uh, was very important to be designed in a way to be effective in proving knowledge from students, uh, not easily, uh, let's say, uh, uh, cheatable by students, uh, and so being uh, a good way of measuring what students have actually learned. To overtake all of these problems, uh, speaking to themselves, engaging with students, uh, uh, somehow finding creative ways of doing practical activities, and then doing examinations online, teachers uh, creative solutions. So they managed to use more effectively the chat, more effectively online messaging during the lesson with the students to keep, let's say, a sense of the class and to keep them engaged. Most of our students were connecting from uh, their homes and there were two, three, four people connected together on the same internet connection, doing different lessons of different uh, classes or schools, or maybe working as in smart working from home. So engaging with the student was not so easy because the distractions around them were a lot, uh, but the, the teachers find ways using, as I said, chats or quits or quick questions to the class, showing pictures, showing videos, um, good ways to engage, engage with the students. For practical activities, uh, what most of the teachers did, some of the teachers did, let's say, was to uh, 
doing in parallel these activities with small groups of students. So for instance, we had a cooking teacher that cooked uh, in front of the webcam and showed the recipe to be, uh, to be done by students while students were doing the same on their on their houses uh, and and the teacher just by looking the webcams and trying to understand the the, the 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 greatest mistakes the students were doing trying to help them doing the practical activities more effectively of course practical activities were very much sacrificed but yet something was that was done and was possible to to be done and then we have the test and homework part where as we said we tried to leverage technology but also we tried to, uh, let's say, structure these activities to be um, less painful, uh, more in line with the possibility of measuring real understanding of, of the students. So the teacher, as I said, So it was important to support them. To support them, we created a community, a community of teachers that we called the digital champions. And you can see uh, the picture there. It's a reminder to a famous uh, soccer competition, football competition in Europe. And probably I should I should pay some trademark for that. But um, so we created this digital champion community where all the teachers should, could share their experiences and share what they did in class, what worked. And what worked not to other teachers so that i mean the pace of learning the pace of adapting to this new technology could be uh, higher could be quicker and so the results could come more quickly uh, so this element the uh, digital champion community was probably one of the most effective uh, organizational solution that we implemented We were able to uh, share what was working, um, leverage experience from others, and so achieving higher results with their students. So the students, uh, uh, in contrast to the expectations of the, of the beginning of the crisis, uh, um, we had a very good uh, feedback from, from students. We need to remember that all the, anything we do in education is intended for the students. So we do teaching for the students to learn, not just for the sake of teaching. And so we are very much focused on what the students take for themselves, what they learn and how they grow. Um, fortunately, the students, uh, I mean, the participation of the students in this phase was very very good they accepted the new training methods very well some of them complained uh, but most of them uh, understood the so spending the education completely um, apart from that we also measured a very good and strong participation of students uh, um, in the activities so the fear that we had the students were passive just listening to teachers speaking online and taking notes eventually but more most of the time thinking about ourselves uh, other things um, this was not the case the chat and all these direct message and direct interactions were able to provide a very good participation of students in the activities and some of the students the more shy students participated more to the classroom activities than they usually do in physical presence because probably they felt less judged they felt less less disturbing um, uh, writing a, a line in the chat instead of in or more rich than the participation uh, in the classroom, in the physical classroom. And then, uh, of course, Maybe the students are more... Voice is breaking a bit. Uh, your connection seems uh, not to be poor, uh, to be poor yes. but uh, just one more minute, please. Thank you. Okay, yes. And, and then, of course, the students were very uh, young and, let's say, uh, digital natives, and so they easily used the technological tools. So, um, 
in this context, so what, what's what's the, the thing that we, we, we bring apart, we, we take back? So the results are good. We were able to continue education. You can see some chart here that show the number of hours and numbers of activities that we had online, and they grew. And as you can see from the pie chart, we also had students coming from any kind of device. And probably uh, not something that we wanted to have, yet something positive brought, was brought by this crisis. Of course, uh, uh, we somehow started to use more e-learning in digital platforms, but we also uh, were urged to, let's say, innovate the way we organize courses. So we started flipping the classroom. We started creating uh, content in micro learning uh, ways. So creating small pieces of content to be fed to the students. And so we take the opportunity to reorganize completely our didactic didactics and our way of, of educating and, and teaching. And I think this is something positive. I think this is something that should be leveraged and should remain even after the crisis. So uh, thank you for, for, for your patience, for, for, for listening to me. Uh, this is a very famous so the digital transformation in education and in our company was brought probably by COVID-19, but it's our goal now to make it remain even after the crisis will be ended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I think that online learning is really a puzzled uh, um, uh, concept. Uh, thank you for your experience. And I think we can uh, adopt it in many countries and many subjects. Thank you. Yeah, and we like there was so many related things with learning continuity that you you know said were in sync, and we are working ourselves on a project with Natalia on a video wiki where we are you know trying to address these four challenges in content, curriculum, uh, classrooms, and coaching. So uh, we would like to well after yeah we the, can get in touch after the, the, the conference. Yeah. You have my contacts. Yeah. I would be pleased to hear from anybody in the room. We will share your contacts and thank you again for uh, coming and sharing your uh, thoughts with us. Thank you. And next, uh, Luca. Luca. Yes. Uh, Luca, I have uh, given you the presenter rights. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah. yes hello. Okay. And I can you? Me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will try to share my screen as well as the others. Uh, screen sharing. And I will present you. Luca okay. is a mathematics teacher and the international secondary school. lost natalia uh, i was afraid it was me but no no uh, just a moment i have who, who yeah, is sent to german at lay and teacher trainer at university of uh, Ivry and specialized in international mathematics pedagogic compression and now he will present us some um, uh, instruments uh, for distance learning and distance concept thank you you're welcome Okay. Luca, we'll go out of the room. All yours. Uh, you can start with the presentation. Okay, just just check. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and do you see my presentation? At, yes, screen? we see your presentation. We okay. see you too. Okay, this is perfect. Okay, so hello everybody, and thank you very much for your invitation. I'm really glad to be here today and um, share experiences and questions with you. I, uh, I, I think I will go in the same direction as Andrea and Renata before me, um, asking some questions about the results and improvements and which could be the consequences of this experience, incredible experience, uh, negative experience actually, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, in the world. Um, I'm Luca Agostino, I'm a math teacher in the Paris region, and I work as teacher trainer in university, University of Ivry. Um, in this presentation, I will start 
by list the main issues for teachers during this period. Um, I, I want. I just want to be to be precise on the fact that I will speak about contents. I mean, I will speak about what to put inside a a, a virtual class or um, a lesson in this situation. I will not speak about every uh, all logistic stuffs which are very important um, but now I think we, I think I really I'm really interested in the questions about what to put inside our lessons during lockdown so the first the, the main problems were to how to transpose the, uh, the, the, the teaching expertise at distance and to foster students autonomy and avoid lack of motivation in order also to keep a social link and minimize the school inequalities. Um, this was also um, the main one of the issues was how to uh, work in a team uh, during lockdown and how to do an assessment. And in this in this sense, uh, um, Andrea uh, answered this question in a very complete uh, uh, way. Um, before to go in the details about pedagogy, let's say, let's say um, I ju just one word. There is a very important thing we have to have in mind when we speak about devices and uh, supports for new pedagogical um, adventures. The law in each country is different, and we have to know that there are some uh, softwares platforms, etc., which are forbidden in some countries. Just an example, for instance, in France, you have a law who, um, uh, who makes forbidden to use Google Drive with students because of uh, data trade treatment and privacy policy, etc. So it is very important because this could be the, 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 the first point if we want to build something to be useful in eventually in the new lockdown. Um, I will try to work using hashtags or keywords if you want. So the first one are centralization, sharing and collecting. The first point all the teachers pointed out at the end of the lockdown was the need to of one uh, unique place where students and teachers could find information. It could be something like a shared, um, a shared, um, a shared Google Drive, etc. If you can, of course. Um, and another very nice thing to do it could be a collaborative agenda, where uh, uh, where students find day by day what they have to do in this in a unique place for all the topics of the day. And in the same in in, in the same way, we can imagine something like a. a a grid avancement on, 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 in French, we, you, can, you, 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 can, you can translate it as notes table, where students are aware of what they did and what they have to do in order to be in time with homeworks. Now, if you, if you, want, to, if you want to go inside the class, um, we have to speak about interaction, diversity and change. Um, um, Andrea spoke about the idea of the virtual class, which cannot be a, a usual lesson as in class. We cannot imagine that the pr pr teacher speak, speaking alone during one, two, three hours. So we have to foster um, the interaction of students by using devices allowing, for, for example, um, uh, students to write on the screen or to participate in chat exactly as um, Andrea said. And other ways to do that is um, to send students uh, pedagogical material, learning material uh, done and created by the teacher, with the teacher. When I say with the teacher, I mean with the physical presence of the teacher. For example, with the video, as you can see here, or just the voice. But what, what is clear is that the physical presence of the teacher is, um, is uh, is important more than that is mandatory because if we want students uh, speaking we need to give them our presence as a teacher um, one one thing which is very interesting when we speak about uh, distance learning is that we can we can um, work 
uh, the diversity of uh, of students and changing changing the, the ch changing the support for example the device etc in order to um, in order to uh, um, uh, to speak to each students to e uh, to its the problems is way to look at the, at the topics for example you can imagine to do personalized tests uh, online tests as a beginning of autonomous work of students because you can you, you can imagine to ask to produce videos to students and this is a very individual work job and it could be useful what Roberto and Renata was were, were, uh, were talking about about assessment you know because if you have a video where a, a student speak you are sure that is his voice her voice and and in any case also if the result uh, i mean the problem solving for example or or the production is copied or is inspired by something else the act the moment of the video is a personal moment so this is a very interesting way to um ask uh, students to work you or you, or you can use another kind of approach for example we have you have interactive maps to freely surfing you know so students are free to find information inside an interactive maps or interactive internet site that you can build and you can use. Um, hopefully, we have a lot of very good internet sites with a lot of materials for different topics. Um, for concerning foreign languages, you, we have a lot of materials online. So this is very this is depend this depends really on the needs uh, on the on the will on the willings of the teacher. Um, in this sense, I speak about non-linearity of the pedagogical action, which means that we can imagine synchronous and not synchronous work. The moment of the of the class, the virtual class, is the synchronous moment, such as a normal class. And then you have other moments of learning which are not under your control, but which are, um, let's say, organized by the teacher and checked by the teacher using for example one-to-one -one rendezvous or an individual uh, learning uh, adapted to the speed of each student for example with di di different questions different di different level of uh, questions finally there is um to me there is another very important point which is the place of the game um we have the possibility to use a serious game uh, in order to motivate and um, foster the presence of students during our lockdown sections, um, sessions. Sorry. In this sense, the idea is to um, is to feed a social links, social links with students by building or rebuilding the group uh, using the game. For example, here you have the example of uh, uh, in an escape game created by teachers with different topics, math, French, and history, Spanish, etc. You know, this is the, 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 the same idea of, of, of the teacher speaking. Teacher is playing the game of the distance learning, such as students. And this motivates students because they see that their teacher is in action. And so the, they, are in, they are inspired by that and they can go um, more in the in in the answer in the answer of what is asked. Um, in other, you, you you can also imagine imagine to take time with them, uh, distance time, just to speak with them about the daily life or other topics, culture, etc. We tried an exam. We tried an experience very interesting because my class this year we, uh, was an Erasmus Plus class. An experience of building an opera, uh, an opera, a distance opera, let's say, about Don, Don Juan, Don Giovanni, Don, Don Juan. And so we invited a, a singer who, who, who gave uh, opera lessons to students in uh, Zoom, as you can see here. Okay, so um, everything is very interesting, but now what do we need? So what does a lockdown school need? The first thing is the centrality of the teacher's equip. 
So the team is in order to create and keep the social link with students using a pedag pedagogical approach based on projects. Um, it is very important that we can uh, build a team of teachers with around, let's say, a common project, a common cultural project. Um, this is a point which allowed students to feel as a part of the, of the group and then um, avoid, you know, avoid absences or lack of motivation. Then the interaction, interaction with a, and between students using online resources, virtu uh, uh, virtual resources with a constant presence of the teachers. Synchronous and not synchronous school, as I said, with very div diversity of, of, of subject and very diversity of sections. And finally, it is very important, but it becomes more um, logistic stuff, simple and available digital devices, because because we have a problem, of course, of internet, of connections, of disponibility and flexibility, etc. So here is a, a, an idea of three, three, three main questions. How can we guarantee an equal access to digital support for our students? First point, because without that, we cannot imagine and distance school. How can we organize a two-way teaching? Let's say half present, half distance, in the hypothesis that we need to do that in September. Which are the interactions between students, between students and teachers? Which are the, mo the most e efficient way to test and so to follow student progresses? What about the assessment? So we are, we, I think this is a very central point because learning, we had an expertise now. Uh, teaching, we have an expertise now, but assessment is a very, very difficult point. And finally, of course, the question about logistics, I didn't speak, I didn't, I didn't, sp I didn't, I didn't speak about, sorry, about that, but it's a very central point. Actually, it's a, it, it is a point regarding directions, head, heads of schools. So we as, as, if we speak about teaching and teachers, I think we have to concentrate ourselves on the contents of our lessons. But finally, I would like to leave you with a, with a message, which is um, we have each country has a very, very specific uh, expertise and very different schools. So we know how to do, uh, how to do things. And maybe our question are, is answered by another country. Let's just, ju just see some examples. In UK, you have the variable rooms, disposition and student number. They do, they do that. In France, you don't have that, but you have a national platform for virtual classes um, it, uh, with no problem about privacy, sensitive data, etc. In Italy, they are, um, uh, they are used to have a single room for, for a single class, avoiding movements in the school during the day. Finally, in Germany, they have uh, moments for teacher to students uh, rendezvous meetings so one-to-one -one meetings avoiding big groups so you see the idea is that of course we have to ask ourselves but i think uh, this uh, this meeting you organized today is 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 is, is fantastic because it allows us to have a regard a different regards coming from different countries where Uh, uh, I, I, I finished my presentation with this slide, giving you some uh, some references about uh, uh, online devices and uh, stuff, which of course is not satisfying. It there is, there is a much more things to do, but it is a first point. These are my contacts, uh, contacts, and I will be very happy to exchange about this uh, this uh, subject uh, with you uh, again. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Luca. Yes, it's uh, it's a great uh, time. I was just taking a screenshot of your last slide, and uh, you know, we hope Video Wiki is also very soon integrated into that. Uh, yeah, so, but I can I can put you uh, my slides as uh, available. No, we are developing it, so we would need you know some of your expertise in terms of understanding. You know, as you said, that uh, most important thing that. Most of the things you have cracked down, but uh, one thing, assessments is something that you are planning to do that. So we are working on four areas. One is content, 
curriculums, coaching, and classrooms. So our team is developing, and I'm very, very sure they are listening to this session uh, very intu, uh, you know, very inquisitive. Okay. And we will discuss about that uh, with you okay. also. Okay, which pleasure. So thank you for joining us, and uh, I present the next speaker thank with you. you, the last session of the day, which is Iona. So, uh, Natalia, if you can make the introduction, I will just activate her. Um, uh, she's a participant innovator and strategist, mentor, workshop facilitator in Wavy and Savvy. Joanna will tell us about network learning and innovation. We are ready to listen. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hello, um, <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, what great energy in the summit today. Um, let me just share the screen. One second. So you can see what I'm seeing. Yes. Um, so whenever you are ready, we are leaving the room now. Let me see. Yes. Are you seeing uh, my screen? Yes. Um, how do I? I can't uh, move to the next one. Why? I'm sorry, just a sec. We see your web browser. You see what? We see your web browser. We see Harvard Business School. Oh, Business okay. Radio. No, it's the wrong. I'm sorry, just a second. Um, let me just try that again. I'm sorry, just a second. I'm trying to. I was going to upload it, but it's a little, a little on the heavy side. I'm sorry. Um, entire screen Okay, I got it, I think, this time. It's the right one there. Yeah, you see it. Yes. Um, but how do I move to the next slide? Uh, the question here is still, we see your PowerPoint. We do not, like, are, are you presenting it in full screen? Yeah, I want to do it in full screen, but somehow I can't. Um, is it, are you seeing it in full yeah, screen? Yeah, yeah, now it's, now it's good. Yes. Okay, it's good. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Sorry for the delay, everyone. Thank you for having me today. So should I start? I'll jump right in. The floor is all yours. <laughs> so um, as Natalia said, I'm Joanna from Wabi Sabi. Um, it's a, we're a New York-based uh, strategic design and innovation uh, consultancy. We support um, organizations through change um, for generative innovation, social impact, um, and sustainability. Um, today, I want to talk to you guys about network learning and innovation. Um, I think it fits right in with a lot of the other topics that were um, developed earlier today. Um, uh, it's it's an important uh, it's an important area for us to consider. Um, so let's jump right in, and uh, we'll take a look at how um, network learning essentially is a way to reframe um, problems together um, in in a group setting from different um, industries. Uh, having experts' perspectives to help us unpack difficult problems that we're all facing in education, in almost every area um, that the pandemic has touched, um, especially in these um, times of uncertainty where um, everything is just changing so fast. Um, it is uh, it is important to see problems as opportunities, however, um, for systemic change and reframe them uh, in a new way. So my goal today is to provoke you to reframe your assumptions, your beliefs, and the way you approach uh, problem solving. Um, with uh, actually a story that got me um, got me on this journey, I was talking with uh, a friend of mine 
who is a mother and a public servant. And her daughter uh, had to obviously stay home along with all the rest of the kids um, to do distance learning. Um, she um, actually uh, told me some things that you don't hear about in the news about the difficulties that she was facing with that, uh, which is that um, at, along with the teachers, mothers have to sit with their children or parents have to sit with their children while studying. So what you're dealing with at this point is um, an additional problem to designing new processes, which is overlap, um, having having longer hours for people, working working parents have to attend their children during distance learning um, sessions. So you now have uh, a teacher, a parent, um, and a kid on the session, whereas normally you would have kids in a, in a classroom. So, um, this got me thinking in the interrelationships of problems in, in the system that we're in, which is quite complex. Uh, and we need new ways to diagnose uh, these problems, um, focusing more on the relationships that they have with each other versus just the problems. Um, to unpack them um, in, in, a different, uh, in a different way, uh, to break them down and see uh, and see if we can see them with a different, um, for, through a different frame. So what happened was during, uh, during lockdown, uh, after this discussion, I started developing a process by borrowing different tools, design thinking human-centered tools um, to essentially develop a pr problem diagnosis framework um, by remixing different components of other proven methods where, um, you can, you can facilitate this kind of uh, diagnosis and problem solving uh, in a more exploratory and agile, um, hands-on fashion um, through collective discovery, reframing, and at the same time, this actually builds uh, uh, resilience because it makes us more, uh, uh, more ready for change, essentially. So, you know, to break down, um, to break down the problem, any problem, um, for example, the one that I, I shared with you before from my friend, uh, you might think that that's an education problem. So we have to focus on that, develop new processes, um, and streamline um, streamline distance learning so that uh, we can potentially relieve parents from having to sit with their children so they can be more attentive in their lessons. However, there's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's other drivers and triggers that lead to change and the problems that we face, and there's a variety of consequences. So I borrowed this, um, this tool, which is uh, called a futures, it's a futures wheel um, diagram, to just sort of try to unpack this, um, this, uh, exam this problem that my friend shared as an, as an example. So, but this is trying to show you that while we focus on change and possibly the symptoms of that change, for example, the fact that we had social dis distancing and a lockdown um, in all over the world, which caused us to need um, the, the next consequence from that was remote working and distance learning. However, um, most people are focusing on what I just said before, developing new working processes and tools and uh, also at the same time attending to increase training needs for staff um, in each sector to, to deal with the fact that now you have um, uh, everything happening from a distance. Um, however, uh, what I said before is that uh, the situation with my friend revealed to me that now you have also extended working hours, overlap, so now you have uh, children at home, parents at home, empty school buildings. Uh, this leads to other things, price drops uh, in oil, real estate, transport, construction materials, and so on. So it's sort of a ricochet and ripple effect that goes throughout the system. So what if we were to solve each problem by bringing in at the early diagnosis stage different experts that can give us a more holistic uh, view of these interrelationships and interconnections of problems to help us make strategies that are more change-proof, um, that are more holistic, and that address all these uh, complex interconnections. 
Um, we are and have been for years uh, operating in a very, very complex context um, full of all these interconnections that I just spoke of, which uh, develops shared vulnerabilities, risks, and interests. Um, however, our processes are still fragmented, so you have experts in different fields uh, sitting and designing in a vacuum. So why haven't our processes followed suit? Um, of course, this results to confounding challenges just under the hood with compounding effects uh, from years of functioning in this crisis mode with outdated and inefficient um, take, make, waste uh, models that were developed eons ago. Um, this, of course, is no, is, is no reason um, to panic. There are ways around it, which is why I, was, uh, I, was, I went through this explorative journey uh, developing this process. Uh, many times when I deal with clients, uh, I see that uh, because of panic or f being faced with complex challenges uh, or a crisis like the one that we're in right now, they tend to function in panic mode and just sort of jump to the obvious problem to solve and uh, sort of start designing a solution before even unpacking the problem, which is a common uh, mistake uh, because as we all know, panic is never <laughs> a good advisor. Uh, it leads to poor decision-making and un unintended consequences. So. Most companies jump over the diagnosis stage right into conclusions um, and uh, solving problems. What my uh, my question focus uh, for this project that I'm working on is how might we bring experts together at the early detection stage from different fields to get these more holistic views and unpack problems by reframing them uh, essentially which means that you might actually see that you're not even working on the right problem. You could be working on, on a different one. Uh, or that problem might have a lot more extensions like the example that I showed you uh, before. And it is these relationships and extensions uh, that make, that result in what we all consider sudden change. It is not sudden change. It is um, a, a an expression of all these interconnections over time that might be hidden and we're not seeing them until it's um, too late <laughs> often. So we, my question was, how might we break down these barriers uh, of siloed uh, innovation and strategic planning um, to tap and leverage connected, collective wisdom to mitigate risk, uh, growth and pivoting costs which is something that everyone is focused on right now in every industry from education to corporations to governments and develop more cross strategies that are dynamic um, and can help us uh, confidently move through change and accelerate and amplify impact by working together. Uh, how could we um, uh, liberate essentially uh, hidden potential in change teams um, and boost performance in these uh, with these processes that can bring together people from different fields, transdisciplinary expertise to get multiple vantage points around a problem and help us solve it um, faster, building trust and um, also building long lasting cross sector connections that can ultimately create um, shared value. You might have uh, heard about this or if not, I'm just trying to, to show you, to get you to understand a little bit better what reframing is all about. For example, imagine that you are a building owner and you have a slow elevator and all your tenants are you know, really unhappy and are threatening to leave or break their leases. For example, the obvious problem in this case would be, you know, you would uh, assign this uh, project to, a, to someone to solve it for you, to make the elevator faster or install a new lift or upgrade the motor, or improve the algorithm or, or something in that um, fashion. However, if you reframe the problem, you might find that you can do something much more cost effective and faster. And by focusing on not the actual problem, but maybe another facet of it, like the fact that the weight is annoying. If uh, you focus on that, that would lead you to a different uh, problem space to solve and a different solution to design. How could you make the weight feel shorter? Maybe by putting up uh, mirrors, maybe by um, having a hand sanitizer so people would have something to do. 
and something along those lines. That's, that's the way you can start understanding how you can reframe uh, problems. Now, the advantages of network discovery, which is what my solution uh, that no, I'm exploring. Anna, just one minute more, please. Thank you. Okay. Is, uh, uh, is network discovery, as I said before, to stimulate co-creation and cross-cultivation at an early uh, stage and have a more fluid culture of collaboration. This reveals blind spots, and unforeseen obstacles and helps us better anticipate, navigate unpredictability. Um, it's a way to better allocate your resources during the downturn, promote ownership, and uh, and a variety of other um, of, of other benefits. The process is like this: uh, essentially, you come together from you select stakeholders to come together at an early stage to see your problem from different vantage points. You reframe, creating choices. Then you define by converging to, um, to come to possible solutions. Then you diverge again from a short list of possible solutions to explore to go through the development uh, phase. So the first phase is reframe. It starts by diverging and then converging. And you repeat the process to develop and then iterate and test out your solutions in real time and real life. Um, the idea is to look backwards, reversing the process to question the context and uncover hidden causes behind it. Uh, and if you attach what um, I'm working on, which is called reverse brainstorming, then which means that how could you make the problem worse that gets you even deeper into the problem, into the anatomy of the problem, and can help you find even more exciting uh, problem spaces um, to work on. It's a method you can easily apply. And I'd love to have you guys... Um, Try it out. Uh, if you give the organizers of the event today um, your emails, I can send you as a follow up some tools where you can try this with your colleagues with, uh, or your friends or your family, trying to reframe your own challenges by asking open ended questions and repeatedly asking why to get to the bottom of things, essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, that's because uh, we're running out of time. That's it. Uh, thank you very much, Ayona. In fact, your uh, presentation has been the connection point of how we will introduce the next uh, session of ours, which is okay. the ecosystem builders. So Wonderful. the question that you pose, and I can quote you on that, like, you know, how is innovation built in IK? And uh, this is what our next session is going to be about. So I will Absolutely. close the screen and we jump on to the next uh, room, open it up, and you are free to come and connect there. And we'll Perfect. Have a there. Perfect. And you I will know? send you the presentation so you can uh, share it with your uh, network. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. We'll see you in the next session. Okay. Uh, bye bye. We'll start right now. Yeah. Bye. bye.